Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach to health. I am Dr. Kyle Gillette, and today our guest is, I guess, returning guest is yes. David De Mesquita. Yeah, so thank you for uh, saying my name correctly this time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it is kind of a hard it's, name it, to say. It's hard because the only way that I can tell people how to spell my last name mm-hmm. is D-E pl- plus mosquito with an A at the end instead of an O. Interesting. It really helped me when you said that it's Andalusian, Andalusia. Um, I studied abroad in Granada in Spain, and um, I soon realized that they purposely have a lisp. Uh, Granada, uh, Andalusia is the southern part of Spain. Um, it's where I guess there's a lot of um, like influence from Morocco. The Arabs used to have a nation there, and then I guess the um, you know there's a Moorish influence, but a long history of a lot of different cultures mm-hmm. coming together. And it all ended with purposely having a lisp with the language. <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting. So like the hereditary line of my background, it, they weren't Israelites, but it came up through the, like the Turkish province all mm-hmm. the way up. So they were Sephardic Jew and they settled down in Spain. So they mm-hmm. went all around the Mediterranean. Interesting. And so there's actually a very famous physician. Um, I, I believe... Uh, and this was kind of like during the the Middle Ages, and his name was Averroes. He was a uh, um, kind of like a connector of physi- He was pre Renaissance, so a lot of the physicians in the Renaissance studied him, and he studied the Roman physician Galen. So um, he was kind of like credited as being one of the um, physicians during the Dark Ages. Um, he was Arabic. Very interesting. That uh, kind of like connected a lot of Roman medical knowledge to, um, I guess, Renaissance medical knowledge, which connected to modern day. So um, it was kind of an interesting aside. That is, uh, history is not the point of this podcast, uh, neither is geography. (laughs) Uh, We want to talk a lot about a lot of things. Uh, I know that we have done podcasts before. Um, I believe you did an after hours podcast with James, but... um, Given that we are both in the functional health space, which we define as um, addressing the root cause of any symptom, um, you're also, of course, in the fitness industry. Um, one thing that we encounter a lot, whether it's as an obesity medicine, medicine physician or advising individuals in the fitness industry about um, their diet or supplements or whatnot, is a balance between what I'd call orthorexia, which is... Um, like on this side of the continuum, they are hyper vigilant about their health and they are terrified of doing anything like missing a day of exercise, eating one gram of trans fat, um, the list goes on. Um, and then over here, I guess, is the health at any, let's call it, let's not call it health at any size. Let's call it health at any body composition. Sure. I like that one better, actually. How do you advise people that are trying to find a balance between these two things? You know, it's super interesting because I'm actually going through a process now of transitioning out of bodybuilding. And we were having conversations the other day where there's a point in time I was eating eight meals a day. I was eating 450 grams of protein per day uh, for two, three years at a time. No impact on my labs, by the way. I know that there's a lot of misconception around protein will destroy your kidneys. It's There's a lot of meta-analysis that points to the other direction, unless if you have a renal disease. And I was so regimented and I was traveling from Atlanta, Seattle during part of that period of time. And I was waking up twice a night to eat. I wasn't eating out. Uh, If I did eat out, it'd be sushi. So it'd be like sashimi with some rice. And I would make sure that it met my macros pretty similar to the meal that I was eating. So it was a little bit of a balance in there. And The process that I've been going through in the last year, year and a half or so after my last show, and even before my last show, was finding a really sweet balance between what health actually is, which health is also a mindset, I think is what people forget. And when you're putting yourself into addictive tendencies where you go to extremes, it's never healthy, whether it's dieting down for a show and competing, or it's edit modifying an entire order when you're ordering out you're going to get some oils on the food they're not going to take your oil spray and spray it down and so, cook for you <laughs> so when you say yeah that's true when, when you say sweet balance was the pun intended the so i'm not a sweet so should, person or so else i said be, yes should it be zero sugar because i think um yeah. now that i'm in my uh not crossfit but apparently crossfit phase 
I know that the, uh, and my friend Thomas DeLaura, I know he's done some advising for uh, CrossFit nutrition recommendations, as have others. But I know they say like, you know, very low sugar or no sugar. Like, yeah. Um, you know, use carbs for performance, but low to no sugar. So yeah, I guess sh sugar is a good example of, um, you know, orthorexia, because you can make the case that why not just consume carbs? It's better for your health. Um, yeah, where is the place to advise an individual that, let's say they are a bodybuilder or they are, uh, well, I was going to say power lifter, but they just eat whatever they want. So yeah, never mind. Hard, let's, yeah. say, let's say they're a bodybuilder um, advising them on like what to keep in the house. Because I, I think about from my perspective, mm -hmm. if it's nicotine or alcohol, I'm like keep, if, if you struggle with those things, keep them out of the house completely. Yeah. That's a really, really good question. So I think there's a lot of demonization within the dieting world, whether it's vegans demonizing meat or <laughs> carnivore, which it used to be keto, but carnivore yeah. now um, is the buzzword. And they're demonizing vegetables, saying you're going to die from it. They're toxin for you, you know, again, extremes. So what was the if, breakdown of your protein, by the way, your 450 grams? Is that like a hundred percent whey protein shake or that's hundred percent blended question. chicken? The sad part about it was my, at that point in time, my calories slowly climbed up to around 8,000 calories a day. Uh, I think the max I ever hit was 8,500 or 8,700 calories per day. A hundred percent of it was actually clean besides some sauces that I would add to it. Mm -hmm. The only weight isolate that I would have was hundred grams of protein per day. So it was four scoops of weight isolate and only weight isolate. I wouldn't do concentrates or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It messed up your digestion. When you're eating that much food, you couldn't eat anything else or else you would slow down motility of the gut and everything like that. And I had a really sensitive gut before leading into mm -hmm. that phase, which definitely did not help my gut out at yeah. all by any means. Probably, and I, probably didn't. <laughs> yeah. I don't recommend 450 grams of protein per day. Uh, looking back on everything. Any reason isolate over hydrosolate? <sighs> Yeah, I, I probably not other than costs. Yeah, that that's the thing. I as long as it's high quality, and you're not getting like a bunch of metals and uh, lactates like added into the mix where it's going to mess up digestion mm -hmm. and cause inflammatory markers. I don't see an issue with it. And mm -hmm. I can actually transition back into sugars yeah. where it's are should sugars be demonized? And the answer is absolutely not. I think that there's a nice balance though, where you can have some sugars in your diet. It's not going to kill you. It's kind of mm. like people that demonize fruit because of the fructose. Yep. Well, carbs are going to break down into sugar in the body anyways. Mm -hmm. Now I will say highly processed sugars, if you're having gut issues or inflammatory issues, well, it's where does the rubber hit the pavement? So can you get away with eating an Oreo a day? Now, would I rather eat an Oreo than rice? Absolutely not. That's my personal preference. I'm not a sweet person. However, there are some people that are sweet people out there and, you know, we all have our own demons and we have to come to terms with our demons. So again, if you're mm -hmm. addicted to sugar and you're going to have one Oreo and you know, you're going to eat half a box of Oreos, you probably shouldn't have Oreos in your house, just like you said, mm -hmm. but there is a very nice balance where you can find sugar, some sugary foods that kill off that craving of wanting processed sugars, in my personal opinion, mm -hmm. where you can lean on those fruit is a really good one that I think mm -hmm. is super underrated within the dieting world. I have fruit and I sometimes have to do juice because I'm kind of lazy with my fruit it's where I'll like blend stuff up. But fruit, I think is super underrated as far as a sugar that you can consume. It's amazing for your liver. The liver is probably the most underrated organ in the body, in my personal opinion, for what all it does for the human body. Mm -hmm. And uh, I assume that this would be kind of assuming that the person is in a caloric deficit. Um, of note, not all fruits are high in fructose and fructose is yep. also not any. Uh, oh, I guess we can link our podcast we've done on fructose and the liver up here. There we go. Um, <laughs> is, fruit make, is fruit making you and your liver fat? I believe was the title of it. And the, uh, a short version of a takeaway there is if you're in a huge caloric surplus, then that's going to make you and your liver fat. And if it, um, you know, let's say you're consuming zero, milli zero grams versus uh, 100 grams of fructose per day, the group that consumes 100 grams of fructose per day will have a slightly worse fatty liver. You know, if they're let's say they're putting on 10 pounds a month, um, so don't do that. But that's a lot of fructose. That's a lot. That's a I mean, lot of fructose. That um, it's it's dose dependent. The dose makes the poison, like anything else. Yeah, and I think that uh, choosing certain fruits, especially like in an off season, for instance, where you're mm -hmm. consuming a lot of food. So, for instance, on season, I lean into berries because yep. they're you get a relatively solid amount of berries 
per glycemic index and how much actually carbohydrates are in it. Mm -hmm. uh, really good with antioxidants as well when you're dieting down, especially when you're really taxing your liver and it mm -hmm. going d doing things that you probably shouldn't be doing, getting ready for a bodybuilding show. When I was losing my uh, 30 pounds of excess body fat, when uh, after I had my first son, I consumed, I remember uh, people know that I loved Greek yogurt, I loved spinach, but I would eat a pound of strawberries. A that pound? A pound of strawberries, yeah. And I, I forget the total number of calories in those strawberries, but it's actually pretty low. Were you pregnant? I was not, but I had sympathy that my wife is pregnant. So. <laughs> I was also trying to gain that recommended uh, 25 to 35 pounds body weight during pregnancy. <laughs> you know, it's balance, right? Yeah. We, we had to be there for our significant others no exactly. matter what. <laughs> and, then I, and then I lost it afterward too, so. Um, no, that's, that's awesome. Good. That's a lot of strawberries though. I think if it wasn't for the cost behind it, I would probably be eating more fruit potentially, but yep. it does definitely get expensive. Um, but off season, the other fruit that I was gonna talk about that I really like is uh, pineapple and papaya mm -hmm. for the bromelain content for your Certainly. gut. And uh, reducing down inflammation when you're in a high caloric surplus is like the holy grail for making sure that your systems are in place and your digestion is staying in check because that's going to be the massive limiting factor when it comes to muscle mm -hmm. growth and really trying to hit a high caloric surplus without having issues there. Yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. Um, it's uh, somewhat individualized too. So I know some people cannot tolerate pineapple well. So for those individuals, maybe you look at something else like apple cider vinegar or even a supplement. I think Jaro has a good supplement with both quercetin and bromelain and the quercetin is not extremely bioavailable. Sometimes you want it to be, sometimes you don't want it to be. Um, we'll do another podcast about supplements mm -hmm. and uh, overrated and underrated, which doesn't necessarily mean bad or good. Again, um, really no supplement or no medication is bad or good. Um, you're just trying to find the therapeutic window and then um, uh, scale back on the hype for some and then maybe hype up some other ones too. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's it's always interesting. Um, and I love Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan's podcast. I think he sheds light on a lot of yes. interesting subjects. So if there's a buzzword or new supplement and it comes on his podcast, all of a sudden it's the next big thing, mm -hmm. even though it may have been around an industry for 10 plus years. Yep. Uh, the big one actually in the bodybuilding space that came around within the last probably three years, I'd say, was metformin. And that metformin mm -hmm. was actually introduced in the bodybuilding industry probably 20, 30 years ago or so. And it was already debunked that it sounds like it's the holy grail on paper for bodybuilding and muscle growth. However, it's really not. Um, but it does have a, a lot of really positive use cases for sure. I yep. think it's one of the few medications out there that is one of like the holy grail of supplements. Mm -hmm. um, three to five years ago, metformin was for sure an overrated med. And now I think it's swung back to underrated. It's so yes. weird to see because you see individuals, I guess I'll just say some names like Fuad Abiyad and talking about um, metformin and how it's overrated. And I suppose when he talked about it, it probably was overrated. And now nobody even wants to take a metformin, even if it's once a week, nobody wants to take a metformin, even if they're on rapamycin or whatnot, they think that it's gonna kill their gains. Yeah, you know, I wish that people would start talking about some glutide when it comes to killing gains, though, instead of uh, metformin. I think metformin has an awesome use case. Mm -hmm. I think I would lean into a berberine. I did literally a 25 minute breakdown video on macro studies on yep. the versus the two. And I think berberine is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll do this, talk about supplements later on. Yeah, for sure. We'll save that for later. Um, one other note on the balance between orthorexia and health at any body composition. Um, it seems like there's a, a dichotomy and, um, you know, with some facts are obesity is treated as a disease in medicine. The CDC does consider obesity as an epidemic. So you see a lot of individuals that are um, more towards the orthorexic side of the spectrum. Maybe a lot of people in um, the fitness industry. I guess I'm in the fitness industry now too. Yeah, you are for yeah. sure. Um, but you see a lot of individuals saying, you know, we just need to do lifestyle recommendations. We don't need any medications. You need to eat healthy and exercise and diet and sleep a hundred percent of the time. And that starts to imbalance things like your social health, your mental health, your spiritual health. Um, you affect other individuals in your life as well. But, um, I, I think that's like well characterized. How do you approach a situation where uh, someone's trying to tell you that there's health at any size, 
or health at any body composition. Yeah, there's been a massive, I don't want to say societal push, but a societal push nonetheless towards health at any size, which I don't really like that terminology. I do believe that you can be healthy and on paper even overweight. For instance, if we're looking at BMI, mm -hmm. I'm technically obese on the scale. And from a body composition standpoint, I'm very lean for my size. Now, is it extra pressure on the heart? For sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a bigger guy for my height. As you can tell, I'm a little bit shorter than Kyle. Uh, <laughs> and the issue that I have with it is being obese and being 30 to 50% body fat mm -hmm. is not healthy. You might be healthy at around 30% body fat on paper. However, you can definitely be healthier. And I think that it's where, again, does the rubber hit the pavement? I do believe that you should be comfortable in your own skin, whether that being overweight or not. Mm -hmm. However, I can tell you from personal experience time and time again, even wor working with plus size model that transitioned away from it due to health issues where they were actually pushing size on these women to get more paychecks actually and more, <laughs> more jobs that she transitioned all the way into basically became modeling. And she, so she went from one end of the spectrum to the hmm. other end of the spectrum. During wow. that period of time, she developed actually PCOS, a severe case of PCOS. And that's where I think that long-term ramifications of health at any size can really come into the equation and looking at full spectrum of everything where you can be healthy and be overweight on paper from a BMI standpoint, from a body mass, from a lean body mass index point, I mm -hmm. think is where you should be looking. My, my friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon likes to say a lot of individuals are overly fat and underly muscled. Um, yes. A lot of individuals who are overly fat actually have a lot of lean body mass, but then when they lose the the fat, they are under muscle. So, and then conversely, a lot of your general population that is not obese is also not metabolically healthy because they truly are under muscled, especially females is just uh, tends to be that way. They develop sarcopenia and osteopenia more often. So uh, some takeaways for this, that's one reason why we like body composition monitoring, like DEXA scans, even though they're not perfect, you do it the same every time and you can track your own um, response to the DEXA scan. That way it, it's just, uh, it's more objective than a scale. And the other big thing, and this has been pointed out by a lot of individuals, is exercise. Exercise is medicine. And if you are metabolically healthy at a high BMI, I would say 100% of those time, 100% of the time, exercise is what the protective effect is. I, I would completely agree there. A lot of health coaches actually nowadays, they Sometimes they do weekly reads and we're talking about, extent, again, extremes. I don't want someone to ever track their weight daily. I don't think it's really needed. It creates addictive personalities. So that's one issue with it. And if you do, you should average it over the, like two weeks yes. or even a month. I agree with that. You need to take a means of the overall data because there's always going to be weight influxes. For instance, from a bodybuilding standpoint, I'll drop eight to 12 pounds in a night and I'll wake up lighter. So again, you can drop weight by going to the bathroom technically. Yeah, you go on keto and you lose a pound of <laughs> glycogen and five pounds of water. It's like, oh, I lost six pounds on keto and yeah. now it's not working as well. Well, that's just because you lost your glycogen and water weight. I water like follows glycogen just like water follows salt, just like water follows yeah. creatine, so. Uh, my favorite scale is your belt. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, that's my favorite scale is where, how many notches on the belt. Do you have to cut a hole in your belt by the point when you're doing weight loss? So I think that's an amazing measurement. Yeah, how close fit is great. I just did a mini podcast and I was just talking about how the goal of looking better in the summer is to look better in clothes or I guess look better without mini clothes on. Yes. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter what the scale says. It matters how you look um, and how your health is at the same time concurrently. Yeah, that's actually a really good measurement of overall health is how good do you feel in your own skin without clothes on, right? Because when I originally started getting to weightlifting, I was 135 pounds. And the ultimate goal was look better without clothes on. That was it. It was a very simple thing to live life by. Now I wasn't like a nudist or anything like that, but uh, that was a very, <laughs> that was a very, very simple goal. Um, and also make sure that you're confident in your skin. And that's the most important thing, I think, for overall health, mental health, and well-being. 
Yeah, I like that you said overall health and mental health because even if you objectively look good in your own skin, if you don't feel good in your own skin, then that's when you look into things like mental health and social health and your stress level and other things that may be affecting it. Yep. Um, I guess this is a good time to segue into uh, a bit more re related to gut health. One thing that uh, I guess we share in common is a lot of people seek us out for um, gut health protocols, largely lifestyle interventions, diet, exercise, sometimes supplementation. And it's common to have people come to us with uh, what, what's like uh, known to the layman as histamine sensitivity or histamine insensitivity. They have an intolerance to histamine. They can't have high histamine foods like leftovers. They might have mast cell hyperplasia. What's the deal with this term and how did it all of a sudden become so common? I think it's become really common within the last five years, I'd say. More common within the last three years where it's being popularized. Mast cell syndrome is the terminology for it. And I'm not sold on it on paper and in practice and biofeedback wise, I would have mast cell syndrome. However, I also had gut dysbiosis or poor microbiome and bacteria in the gut for almost 10 years. And that leads to histamine issues. It, yeah. That is a very good term that leads to histamine issues. So a lot of conditions can be primary or secondary and um, mast cell syndrome is a real phenomenon and treating it. Yeah. So if you, if you have like a cookie cutter protocol that gives everybody DAO, for example, or quercetin or chromalin, there's a whole bunch of different protocols, but it does treat the symptom and it does work mm -hmm. and it is real. So those symptoms are not made up in your head, right. but it's kind of like saying, you know, all these individuals have, let's call it beta cell syndrome. The beta cell is hyperactive and the insulin's too high. So you treat with things like berberine and metformin that make insulin go down. So is that beta cell syndrome or is that largely secondary to caloric excess and genetic predisposition and lack of exercise? Yeah, I in secondary for sure. Like almost every single time it's secondary. There are... <laughs> On paper, there's very low genetic components to it that they've been able to find where yeah. there may be some type of family passed down on mast cell syndrome. However, are you looking at the environment that these people are growing up in? Mm -hmm. Maybe they have toxic mold in their environment when they're kids. Yep. Something as simple as that. When you're in that environment, you better believe you're going to have histamine issues. You're going to have issues breathing. I, I live in Georgia. So in Georgia, I was having to take Zyrtec twice a day and I probably didn't help my DAO. So DAO is the enzyme in the kidney that's produced to help to get rid of histamines. Yep. So a lot of the treatment that you would do is a high amount of DAO to start pushing out the histamines. And again, it does work at acute, it works acutely but not functionally, where it's going to address that underlying issue the majority of the times. Yeah, which is what functional medicine is supposed to do, is to address the, the root cause, not the secondary cause. That's one of the ironic things, is, and it's one of the difficult things about being a functional medicine provider, being in the functional health space for many years now. I sympathize with people who seek out functional medicine because there is a selection bias. If there's somebody and the uh, traditional healthcare system hasn't worked for them, then they are more likely to have zebras. So zebras are things that are uncommon. Horses are things that are common in medicine. A lot of med students like to chase the zebras. And a primary mast cell hyperplasia would be a bit of a zebra. Um, you know, even things like uh, a heavy metal toxicity or a tick-borne infection, I certainly see them and I certainly have patients that have had these, but they're a bit more of a zebra. Um, symptoms are, uh, for example, if uh, let's say there's a patient that has hypothyroidism. It's probably more related to just idiopathic hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's than it is secondary to some sort of poisoning or toxicity. Absolutely. And hypothyroidism, especially within women. And unfortunately, this is one thing that I see all too often is women in their teens actually even being put on thyroid medication sometimes instead of a natural glandular or something like that and being told, hey, you need to start doing meditation or going out for walks and giving some people coping tools to help with putting them back into a parasympathetic state, you know. Thyroid medicine is not necessarily a lifetime medication. Um, if you have a TSH starting under 10, 
then there's a pretty good chance that you could get off. Um, not a hundred percent chance, and this is not your own individual medical advice, but just as a rule of thumb to help with some actionable takeaways. Even if your TSH is a touch over 10, if you're in the postpartum state, if you had just delivered a baby, then there's also a chance that you could get off. But um, talk to your own doctor about all that. So yeah. I think that's a good summary of all that. Yeah, I had a woman that actually had a 25 TSH and completely on the natural side of it, worked with coping tools, reducing inflammation. It was actually hormone dysfunction as well. It looked at Graves' disease on paper, and then it looked like her thyroid wasn't functioning all the way back online and optimally again within about a two, three month span of time. So I definitely said that you can usually turn things around, um, even when it comes to autoimmune diseases. I think that's a great summary. Um, speaking of individuals talking to their own doctor about their own plan, um, <laughs> We, we were talking earlier and we kind of came up with this term. So, uh, you know, for Black Friday, they have the door busters. That's what you're saying and what you're getting as soon as you pop through the door. So when you go to the doctor, you have something called the chief complaint and, um, you know, you have a certain goal. So maybe for someone seeing you, it's to be a certain percent body fat or look a certain way. Maybe for seeing me, they come in and they're saying, hey, just general health. But there's another concept. We, we're calling it door lever. It's something you say when you are leaving the door or maybe door closer, we could say. Yeah. So a door closer is uh, the doctor is leaving the room and you say this right, as this right as the doctor is leaving. So the most common one by far has got to be ED. Yeah, I'd say anything that on like more of a personal note where it kind of like hits home for you is really the ones. And it's usually the big ones too. It's always the big terminologies where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, cool. That would have been nice to hear in the first 30 mm -hmm. seconds of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, especially when it comes to things like uh, chest tightness, you know, having some lightheadedness. Uh, it's like, oh, by the way, doc, one, one more thing. And uh, we're certainly like, it's great. We're glad that people will tell us something, even if it yep. is at the last moment. But um, it's just important to, or it can be helpful to consciously think, um, you know, mentioning some chest tightness or some lightheadedness, this is certainly pertinent. And even if you don't want to tell it to the nurse, a lot of patients will just say, hey, I'm here for personal reasons. I want to chat with the doc. And then first thing through the door, um, you know, we will not blink an eye when you say, hey, it's this. And by the way, chest pressure and lightheadedness, I know we should probably talk about it, uh, STDs, diarrhea, uh, anything gut symptom, basically anything that might be a bit embarrassing. Yeah, I would say that most important thing is find a do doctor you can connect with and comfortable having an open conversation with because not everyone's comfortable with having open dialogue with the doctor, <clears throat> especially when you look at if you're going through insurance. Mm -hmm. I actually even have a hard time even though I'm very open with my medical history and what I talk about when I'm going through insurance because what happens if they write that down and next thing you know, your insurance goes up. So it's all medical hit record by that point. So one, I really trust you. You're also a friend of mine. So I'm gonna talk openly with you about everything and you are an out of pocket doctor, which makes it so that's private healthcare. So I'm much more comfortable actually talking with you about that unless if I would have to talk off record with the doctor. And I think that's actually one reason why people wait until they were about to like walk out of the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's probably a happy medium. I do understand that people want to meet the doc and uh, talk for a couple minutes. So maybe in the middle of the visit, that way, if there's just like literally yeah. no connection, then you don't have to mention anything. Um, so maybe in the first half of the visit, it becomes a lot more difficult when your visits are five or 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. um, having an initial visit of like 45 minutes is uh, definitely a lot easier to fit that in. Maybe you say it 15 minutes in, um, whereas an initial visit with uh, a doc in a normal system, the whole visit would only last 12 minutes. And, um, you know, for the record, a lot, a lot of my patients have Christian health sharing. A lot of them have no insurance at all. A lot of them have insurance, but I do consider all of them underserved and underinsured because to um, get the health care that they need, they are not able to like have coverage for that. So that's one of the downsides. And for patients that do have insurance, obviously we do prior offs and we'll run um, diagnostic imaging and um, you know medications through insurance if possible. But most people know that 
even if their insurance covers medication, it's still just cheaper to get out of pocket through something like GoodRx. Absolutely, every single time. And it still counts towards a tax write-off too, just out of pocket. So I found with all the surgeries I've had, which is kind of sad how many surgeries I've had by this point with all my injuries, every single time I pay it out of pocket, that's actually why I go to a plastic surgeon for the majority of my surgeries, mm -hmm. just because they make sure the external looks good with the internal when they do things. It has been 50% of the cost, if not lower than that, every yep. single time. Yeah. Um, there's a service that we use for imaging and also sometimes surgeries. And um, there's actually a couple of them. One's MD Save, one's Savos Health. Um, just as FYI, I don't endorse any of these. But uh, it is interesting to see that there is still a true marketplace. So different surgery centers will bid. And, you know, uh, maybe the lowest bid is the highest quality. But that way you can make an informed decision. Look at some um, reviews. Not that reviews are perfect, but look at some of those. And then um, find someone who's able to perform that service. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a pretty good summary of uh, a lot of different clinical items regarding gut health, regarding fitness space, regarding health at any body composition. Um, so hopefully you have had some good takeaways. As always, thank you for your time and may God bless you with health and happiness.